students, welcome to this, my latest installment of my special topic, Lecture 3's review, systematic review of chapters 9 through 11 of uh, first semester of general chemistry. Whew. In today's lecture, we're going to begin by reviewing heat curves and a few additional enthalpy questions. Are you ready? Let's go ahead and get started. So when ice is heated from negative 25 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, its temperature rises. Now just so you know, it stays solid as long as it remains below zero degrees Celsius. At zero degrees Celsius, however, the ice starts to melt. Because melting is an endothermic process, the ice stays at zero degrees C until all the ice has melted. You can see that shown in this diagram, which is called a heat curve. Once again, we're starting our ice at negative 25. Its temperature gradually raises, but this whole time it stays solid. Solid, 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 solid. As we're pumping heat, the temperature changes, but once it hits zero degrees Celsius, there is no temperature change. Instead, all of the heat energy is used to convert gradually the solid water into liquid water. Once that water is converted into a liquid, at that point, more heat pumped into the system will gradually raise the temperature of that now liquid water. Now, as the liquid water's temperature increases, it eventually gets to 100 degrees Celsius. In between this entire time, it's liquid. At 100 degrees Celsius, much like we saw at zero degrees Celsius, we start to see a phase change. The liquid water begins to boil. However, the temperature does not change. Right at 100 degrees Celsius, anytime we introduce more heat, all of that heat energy does not go toward raising the temperature. Instead, it goes toward converting the liquid water into gaseous water. That will continue to happen until all of the water has completely converted into gas. After that point, then additional heat energy will change the temperature of the now gaseous water. This figure, which depicts all of that, is called a heat curve and illustrates how the whole process unfolds. So that takes us to a great lecture question. What does the following curve heat show if you trace it completely from point A to point F. I'm not going to answer this for you, but I'll invite you to think through this and look at it and then come up with the answer on your own. Here's another question. Which of the following processes is exothermic? Now remember, processes that are exothermic are ones that give off heat. So you can sort of imagine if you're holding your hand near a melting solid, does that feel warm or a liquid that's boiling uh, or being able to convert a liquid into a boiling liquid? Does that consume heat or does it give off heat? Whichever one gives off heat, that's the one that's exothermic. Here's another one. The enthalpy change, or delta H naught, for this transformation, converting liquid ammonia to gaseous ammonia, is equal to this number. And it is positive. What is the enthalpy change of boiling 350 grams of NH3? Now, I'm not going to do this for you here, but I will post a link here to a separate video in which I do that you're welcome to click if you wish to review. We now move on to another topic, that of intermolecular forces. The first intermolecular force that we're going to review is dipole-dipole forces. Here's my explanation of what that means. When you have a molecule that has a polar bond in it, remember a polar bond is one in which two different atoms have a significant difference in their electronegativities. Not so significant that's, that it's an ionic bond, but just one where there's a partial negative and a partial positive charge. When you have that kind of bond, it causes the molecule, once again, to have a partial negative charge on one atom and a partial positive charge on another. When molecules like this cluster together, they line up and stick together in a complementary fashion like this. This is the example of hydrochloric acid. Chlorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen, so it hogs the electrons towards itself, thereby giving it a very strong partial negative charge, leaving the hydrogen as a very strong partial positive charge. When you have a bunch of HCl molecules all together in a soup, the HCLs will line up in a complementary fashion so that the partially negatively charged chlorines are pointing or kind of sticking to partially positively charged hydrogens and vice versa. This force is once again called a dipole force. And this force, this stickiness between molecules, is what gives HCl its relatively high boiling point compared to molecules that have weaker intermolecular forces. The second force I'll teach you is hydrogen bonding. Now, when a hydrogen atom is bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, those three magical elements and those alone, it forms a special type of dipole-dipole force called a hydrogen bond. In this example, we can see water. 
Once again, oxygen as well as nitrogen and fluorine are so much more electronegative than hydrogen that when they bond to hydrogen, they form a very strong dipole. It's not an ionic bond, it's still covalent, but it's a very, very strong dipole where there's a much more partially negative charge on the oxygen and a much more partially positive charge on the hydrogen than there would be in the example HCl that I just showed you. So similar to the HCl example, water molecules will line up and stack on each other in a complementary fashion, pointing their partially negatively charged oxygens at the neighboring partially positively charged hydrogens and vice versa in all directions. This is what's going on at a molecular level if you were able to look very, very closely at a cup of water. Zillions of molecules, and zillions isn't technically a word, but it's a lot of molecules with uh, this kind of thing happening in a complementary stacking effect in all directions. Furthermore, this intermolecular force is what contributes to water's extremely high boiling point relative to molecules that have weaker intermolecular forces. Think about it. You have to heat a bucket of water to 100 degrees Celsius, which is really hot, to get the molecules in it to start wiggling around enough that they'll break apart and then start escaping as gas. That's really high, especially when compared to molecules that have weaker intermolecular forces that I'll talk about momentarily. Our next intermolecular force is called ion dipole. When a polar molecule, that is one that has a dipole, is near ions, those are molecules that have ionic bonds, which are not the same thing as covalent. The partial positive charge on the polar molecule will line up with the completely negatively charged ions, and the partial negative charge in the polar molecule will line up with the completely positively charged ions, like this. This is an example where I've got sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is completely ionic. Once again, make, please make the distinction in your minds. In an ionic bond, I've got more or less a complete transfer of electrons. The sodium gives up its single valence electron to the chlorine completely. They're not sharing. There's not a partial plus and a partial minus. It's a total plus and a total minus. The chloride and the sodium get into water and then dissolve with water molecules taking away the sodium and the chloride separating them. The partially negatively charged oxygens in water now line up with the positively charged cation and sodium, and the partially positively charged hydrogens in water line up with the negatively charged ion chloride. This is why sodium chloride dissolves so well in water, because water is so polar. This intermolecular force here where I've got a force between a polar molecule, water, and a complete ion, chloride, or sodium, is called ion dipole. And it is a very strong intermolecular force. The next intermolecular force I'll teach you is dispersion forces. Keeping in mind that carbon and hydrogen atoms are almost equally electronegative, they're not totally electronegative, but they're really close. Do you think that the following molecule is polar or nonpolar? If you said nonpolar, you're right. If you said polar, so once again, carbons and hydrogens are more or less very, very close in electronegativity. So there's not a strong dipole or strong partially positively charged uh, center anywhere and a partially negatively charged center anywhere else. It's more or less very blah, very bland all the way across the molecule. So this kind of molecule would not have the same kind of stickiness to other molecules of itself that we would see in water or HCl, or between water and sodium chloride. Because once again, there's not a strong partial negative and partial positive anywhere in this molecule to line up in a complementary fashion with another molecule itself to make them stick together intensely. Now that said, nonpolar molecules still can have momentary partial positive and partial negative charges. How? Well, because their atoms and electrons are constantly moving, you might imagine that there would be brief moments, brief moments, in which some of the atoms' nuclei will be partially exposed, which would expose, for just a moment, the partial positive charge from the protons in that nucleus, while other nuclei will have brief moments when all of the electrons are all over them, giving them partial negative charges. Thus, you can once again imagine that as a whole, this molecule isn't going to have strong partial negatives and partial positive charges, but there might be brief moments because the electrons are constantly moving around uh, uh, between atoms, between carbons and hydrogens and carbons and carbons, in which there might be just a brief moment where there's a partial positive exposed and a partial negative somewhere else. These two videos to which I'll post external links and happen to both be narrated, I think, by robots, help illustrate that, and you're welcome to watch them to capture visual images of this. So 
When two molecules with momentary partial positive and partial negative charges line up in a complementary fashion, they can stick together in a complementary way like this. You can imagine, for instance, atom A and atom B having a brief moment in which all the electrons are on one side of atom A and are on the opposite side of atom B. So when they stick together, there's a momentary partial positive charge on one side of that atom and a partial negative charge on the other side of the atom, and they'll, they'll stick together. Once they stick together, then the electrons start vibrating back and forth in a complementary way so that at any given moment, the partial positive on one atom is next to a partial negative on the other and vice versa. They start, in essence, resonating back and forth complementarily. Similar thing can happen between multiple atoms in molecules when molecules stack on top of each other. This type of intermolecular force is called a dispersion force, which is also known as London forces or Van der Waals forces. All molecules have dispersion forces, even molecules that also have dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding. So let's go ahead and review. At the top, we've got dispersion forces, also called London or Van der Waals forces, which are found in molecules that don't have dipoles, such as hydrocarbons, where all I've got is carbons and hydrogens that are roughly equally electronegative, or single elements all uh, sticking together, or other nonpolar molecules. Next in our lineup is dipole-dipole. These are molecules that do have a dipole, that is, one atom or more being uh, more electronegative than another, so that there is a partial negative and partial positive somewhere contributing to sticking molecule on top of molecule. We see dipoles in molecules, once again, where there are larger differences in electronegativity, such as HCl, carbon oxygen, or sulfur hydrogen bonds. The next is hydrogen bonding. This is a kind of dipole dipole that is super strong, and it's specific to hydrogens that are bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Because those three elements are so much more electronegative than hydrogen, you have a very intense partial negative charge on them, while you have an analogously intense partial positive on the hydrogens. The last one is ion dipole. This occurs where you have a molecule that has a dipole in it interacting with another molecule that has an ionic bond, as would be the case with water and sodium chloride. The ions separate out interacting with the polar molecules with partial negatives pointing at complete cations and partial positives pointing at complete anions. These intermolecular forces are all listed, as I have shown here, in order from top to bottom of increasing strength. And for students who take this from me, I do require you to memorize the names and natures of these intermolecular forces, as well as knowing their relative strengths. Incidentally, intermolecular forces are responsible for molecules' boiling points. The stronger the intermolecular force, the harder it is to break apart, and hence the higher its boiling point will be. For example, if I've got a molecule like water, which has hydrogen bonding in it, that molecule will stick very intensely to other water molecules, and therefore I will have to crank in a ton of heat to get those molecules to separate from each other and convert from a liquid into a gas. By comparison, if I've got a molecule of similar size that only has dispersion forces, which are much weaker, it won't require as much heat to get them to convert from a liquid to a gas. This is, in fact, the reason why molecules like methane, ethane, and propane are gases at room temperature and pressure, while water, which has a very similar molecular weight, is a liquid at room temperature and pressure, because methane, ethane, and propane just have dispersion forces, and therefore don't stick together very intensely at all and will just be a gas at standard conditions, whereas water, which is a relatively small molecule, will stick very intensely to other molecules of water because it has hydrogen bonding. To summarize then, when two substances, two different kinds of molecules, have very similar or close to similar sizes or molecular weights, the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point. Now remember, dispersion's the weakest, followed by dipole-dipole, followed by hydrogen bonding. So the idea is if I have molecule A and molecule B and they have close to the same size or molecular weight, if molecule A has much stronger intermolecular forces than molecule B, say for example, molecule A has hydrogen bonding while molecule B just has London forces, then molecule A will have a much higher boiling point. And the reason is because that molecule will stack on top of other molecules of itself and stick much more intensely, which means that it takes much more energy and heat pushed into that molecule to get it to separate out and convert from the liquid to gas. Separately, we can say that when two substances have very different sizes or molecular weights, generally the larger the molecule, the higher the boiling point. Now the reason for that is just because a larger molecule will just have more intermolecular forces than a smaller molecule because there's more points of contact, larger surface area. 
So even if you have weaker intramolecular forces in a larger molecule, just because you have more of them, the larger molecule will often have a higher boiling point than a smaller molecule, even if the smaller molecule has stronger intramolecular forces. Now, sometimes smaller molecules can still have higher boiling points than slightly larger molecules if they have much stronger intramolecular forces. So uh, water, for example, has hydrogen bonding. It's a very, very small molecule with a molecular weight of 18, whereas larger molecules like octane only have London forces, but they still have uh, lower boiling points than water because all they've got is London forces. So sometimes the intermolecular force being stronger can compensate. But generally speaking, once again, the larger the molecular weight uh, or larger the size, as you get larger and larger and larger, you get a higher boiling point just because there are more atoms to stick together, even if they have weaker intermolecular forces. Got it? <laughs> I hope so. Let's take a look then at some questions. Of the following substances, which one has the highest boiling point? I want to pause and take a look at this. You'll notice that I've got hydrogen bonding in molecule A and in molecule E. I do not have hydrogen bonding in B, C, or D. So really, it's between A and E. Those are, and, and all of these are sort of roughly around the same molecular weights, right? So which substance, molecule A or molecule E, has more hydrogen bonding and therefore will stick more intensely to other molecules of itself and will therefore require more heat pumped into it to get those molecules to wiggle apart and separate from each other and convert from a liquid to a gas. Whichever molecule has more hydrogen bonding between molecules A and E will be the correct answer. And here's our final question. Which intermolecular force most greatly accounts for the answer to the previous question? Now that is hopefully obvious. That takes us to the end of this video and the end of all of our video coverage from all of general chemistry. If you have a command of all these topics that we've reviewed from our special topics reviews, as well as all of the topics that we've covered in the second semester coverage of general chemistry, then you are totally ready for our final exam. Now, for those of you who are taking this from me and are not quite in that position, please don't feel bad. Just make sure that you study really, really hard until you get in that place. And once you're in that place where you really know this stuff, you'll be able to march in and nail that exam. Dear students, it's been wonderful having you with me this whole semester of general chemistry. We've covered a lot of material, <laughs> and I've loved being your teacher. I hope that you guys will have an enjoyable rest of your day, and if I don't see you in a future class, I hope that you'll have an enjoyable and successful future career in science. Until then, and until whenever, have an enjoyable rest of your life. <laughs> see you guys later.